Welcome to the Deep Dive from Canna Insights. Today we're tackling, well, a really heavy topic, Alzheimer's disease. We've got quite a bit of research here looking at the preclinical side mostly, and some early clinical hints about cannabinoids, specifically THC and CBD. Yeah, that's right. Our goal today is really to sift through this science. We want to find the core mechanisms, you know, what's happening at the molecular level, what receptors are involved, and crucially, what does the quantitative data actually show? Is there real potential here for slowing down Alzheimer's. Okay, so let's start right at the heart of AD, the uh, the buildup of that toxic beta amyloid protein. And honestly, the sources hit you with something pretty surprising right away. It involves THC. The most well-known cannabinoid, yeah. It does. seems to go kind of head-to-head with some approved AD drugs, and the results are stark. So how does that work? Tell us about the mechanism. Well, it ties into an existing strategy for AD, which uses inhibitors for an enzyme called acetylcholinesterase, or ACE. The idea there is usually about boosting cognition. But researchers found THC, delta-9 THC, interacts with that same enzyme, ACE, but for a different reason entirely. Okay, so what's the comparison? How good is THC at stopping the amyloid buildup, the aggregation? It's fascinating, actually. THC doesn't just block the enzyme's main job. It binds to a specific spot on it, the peripheral anionic site, or PAS. And by binding there, it stops the enzyme from doing something else it does, which is actually helping amyloid proteins clump together. Helping them clump so the enzyme makes it worse. In this context, yeah. And the key finding, this is from Boucher and colleagues back in 2006, is that THC completely blocks this ACE-induced clumping, the aggregation. Completely stops it. Wow. And you mentioned comparing it to approved drugs. Right. And this is where it gets uh, really eye-opening. They looked at drugs like Donkiesel and Tacrin. Even when these approved drugs were used at twice the concentration they used for the THC comparison, they only reduced that aggregation by about 22% or 7%. Only 22 and 7% uh. compared to THC's complete block. Exactly. It suggests THC might have a powerful disease-modifying role here. Totally separate from its psychoactive effects, it's stopping a core pathological process. Okay, so if THC is providing the muscle, like stopping these clumps from forming in the first place via this enzyme, what about CBD? Is it playing a different role? Maybe cleaning up the mess? That's a pretty good way to put it. Yeah, CBD seems to be all about neuroprotection, protecting the brain cells. So in lab studies using human cells, when they expose these cells to toxic amyloid, adding just a little bit of CBD beforehand, we're talking low micromolar amounts, it actually reduced the cell death caused by the amyloid. It sort of shields the cell. Protects them. Oh. Okay. And I saw something about CBD also affecting how the disease spreads because Alzheimer's isn't static, right? It moves through the brain. Precisely. It spreads neuron to neuron. And there's newer work, Reich et al. from 2025 looking at this. They used neuronal cultures and found that CBD, again, at pretty low concentrations, significantly reduced not just the aggregation, but the transport of these bad proteins along the axon. Transport along axons, so moving between cells. Exactly. It reduced the movement of a beta, but also tau, and that hyperphosphorylated tau protein, which is another key player in AD. So it might slow the physical spread of the disease through the brain's network. That's the implication, yeah. If you can limit how these toxic proteins travel between neurons, you could potentially slow the disease progression significantly. Okay, let's shift gears a bit from cells in a dish to uh, whole animals. The results there seem even more dramatic. They really do. We start seeing some quite striking quantitative results in animal models, especially when THC and CBD are used together. Together. Okay, tell me about that. There's a key study from 2024, Silva RN and colleagues. They used rats and induced an 80 like condition chemically. And they treated these rats with an oily cannabis extract. Importantly, the ratio in this extract was roughly 2 to 1 THC to CBD. 2 to 1 THC to CBD. That ratio seems important. What did it actually do in the rats' brains? The outcome was, well, pretty staggering. In the group that got the main dose, they saw an 80% reduction in cell death. 80%. 80% reduction in cell death, specifically in the dentate gyrus. That's a key part of the hippocampus, the brain's memory center, which is hit hard and early in Alzheimer's. An 80% saving of neurons. I mean, that sounds almost too good to be true, especially for AD. Should we be a bit skeptical translating that from a rat right. model? Caution is definitely needed. It's a preclinical signal, a very strong one, but it's still preclinical. We always need to be careful bridging that gap to humans. But what strengthens the finding is that they also looked at underlying mechanisms. The treatment boosted the activity of an important antioxidant enzyme, superoxide dismutase, by up to 15%. And it reduced markers of inflammation and damage, like 
total protein levels, circulating amyloid and nitrite levels. So it confirms the combo hits oxidative stress and inflammation too. Okay, so it wasn't just saving cells, it was improving the environment too. Exactly, and the benefits weren't just in rats. That Raish study also used a simpler model, a type of worm, C. elegans. Worms, how does that work for AD? These were transgenic worms, genetically engineered so that amyloid buildup causes paralysis as they age. And when they treated these worms with CBD, it actually improved their movement. They traveled further and faster. It delayed that paralysis. So even in a very different organism, CBD showed a protective effect against amyloid toxicity. Yes, and they confirmed it was reducing the amyloid oligomers, the clumps, in the worm's head regions. Okay, so summing up so far, THC seems to block aggregation via ACE, CBD protects cells and might stop the spread. It's clearly not just one simple mechanism at play. Definitely not. It's what we call polypharmacology. Cannabinoids hit multiple targets. Of course, there are the classic cannabinoid receptors, CB1 and CB2. CB1 is dense in the hippocampus, which links to memory effects. CB2 is more on microglia, the brain's immune cells, and it gets upregulated during inflammation. Right, the usual suspects. But you're saying it goes beyond those. Much broader, especially CBD. It's a real multitasker. It hits targets completely outside the traditional cannabinoid system. Like what? What are the key non-cannabinoid targets for CBD here? A really important one seems to be PPR gamma. That's peroxisome proliferator activated receptor gamma. PPR gamma. Okay, what does that do? Think of it like a master regulator gene involved in inflammation and metabolism. When CBD activates PPAR gamma, it triggers a cascade of protective effects. It helps shield cells from amyloid toxicity. It can inhibit the problematic tau hyperphosphorylation. And there's even evidence it stimulates neurogenesis, making new neurons. Yeah, activating one receptor does all that. It's a key hub, yeah. And CBD also interacts with other receptors implicated in AD, like GPR55 and even ion panels like TRPV1. It's hitting the system from multiple angles. And seems CBD even gets down to the level of gene expression, turning down inflammation signals. Exactly. This is really sophisticated stuff. CBD can modulate which genes are active, particularly in microglia. It dials down genes that act like accelerators for inflammation. For instance, it downregulates genes like PLCG2 and CTSC. GLCG2 and CTSC. What's their role? Well, PLCG2 is linked to how microglia respond to damage signals. And CTSC, or cathepsin C, basically kicks off a pathway that ramps up neuroinflammation. Hmm. By dampening these down, CBD helps prevent the microglia from going into chronic overdrive, which causes a lot of collateral damage in AD. It's like fine-tuning the immune response. Okay, so the molecular work is powerful. The animal data looks almost miraculous in some cases. But now the big hurdle, humans. Yeah. What do the clinical trials actually show? Yeah, this is where things get, well much more challenging. The reality is there's a real scarcity of large, definitive clinical trials. Randomized controlled trials, RCTs, especially trials designed to show actual neuroprotection over the long term in AD patients. Also, lots of preclinical promise, but a gap in human evidence for stopping the disease itself. A significant gap. Now, THC has been flagged for clinical development in AD, and we do have approved cannabis-based meds for other things. Right, like synthetic THC, dronabinol for nausea or appetite loss in cancer patients. Yeah, exactly. Or nabilone. And then there's nabixmols. That's the one-to-one -one THC.CBD spray, approved in some places for MS spasticity and pain. But those are mostly symptom management in other conditions, not disease modification in Alzheimer's. Precisely. We're still struggling to bridge that gap from just, say, reducing agitation or improving sleep in AD patients to actually proving we're slowing down neuron death. And what makes that translation so hard, apart from the usual difficulties? One major factor is something called hormesis or hormetic effects. This is really crucial for you, the listener, to grasp. It basically means the dose dramatically changes the type of effect a cannabinoid has. It's not just more drug equals more effect. How so? Give me an example. Okay, so a high concentration of CBD might strongly activate a receptor, but a low concentration might actually act as an inhibitor, or what's called a negative allosteric modulator, on that same receptor. So opposite effects depending on the dose. Potentially, yes. Or take THC. A certain dose might improve neurological function in older animals, like we saw, but that same dose, or a different one, might impair short-term memory, especially in younger individuals. That sounds incredibly tricky for developing a standard treatment, finding that just right dose. The Goldilocks zone, yeah. It's a massive hurdle. It demands incredibly precise dosing and highly standardized, consistent product formulations, which hasn't always been the case in cannabis researcher products. Okay, dosing is a nightmare. What else? You mentioned proving neuroprotection. 
How do we even measure that in living people? That's the other huge challenge. Yeah. We lack the right tools. The sources really highlight this. We desperately need better biomarkers, specifically something like a PE scan tracer that can visualize the good kind of microglia, the M2 neuroprotective phenotype. M2 microglia. As okay. opposed to? As opposed to the M1 pro-inflammatory type. Microglia can swing both ways. If we could reliably track M2 activation in the human brain non-invasively, that would give us a direct biological measure of neuroprotection happening in response to a treatment during a clinical trial. And without that? Without that, we're relying heavily on cognitive scores or imaging brain shrinkage over long periods, which is much slower and less direct. We're sort of flying blind, trying to prove the drug is actually protecting the brain tissue. So looking ahead then, given all these complexities, where does the research suggest we should focus? Well, it strongly points back to combinations. That 2 to 1 THC dot CBD ratio that works so well in the rat model, that wasn't an accident. The consensus building is that THC and CBD likely work best together, synergistically. They aren't single target silver bullets. They're more like a multi-pronged attack. Hitting inflammation, aggregation, oxidative stress, maybe that PPAR gamma pathway mm. all at once. Exactly. That multi-target approach might be essential for a disease as complex as Alzheimer's, which involves so many different pathological pathways. The potential is there for these combinations to complement existing drugs, or maybe even offer advantages over therapies that only hit one target. So the future depends on cracking that dosing code, yeah. getting standardized products, and crucially developing those biomarkers, like the M2 microglia tracer. That sums up pretty well. Overcoming the regulatory hurdles is part of it too, of course. Yeah. But yes, standardization, dosing, and biomarkers are key to proving genuine neuroprotection in large human trials. It's certainly clear from today's deep dive that the scientific rationale for using cannabinoids in AD is really strong. I mean, that TAC effect on 8 bloid beta induced aggregation is quite stunning. And CBD's ability to modulate those inflammatory genes and protect neurons, it's sophisticated stuff. It really is. But we have to balance that potential with the very real challenges, the complex dosing, the need for better ways to measure success in humans. Absolutely. The preclinical evidence says keep going. It strongly validates pursuing this. We're past asking if cannabinoids might help AD and now deep into figuring out how to make it work safely and effectively in people. Okay. Well, before we wrap up, just the standard reminder. Mm -hmm. Everything we've discussed today is based on scientific literature. It's not medical advice. Please don't interpret this as an endorsement for self-treating any condition. Always talk to your doctor or healthcare provider. Thank you for joining us for this deep dive. Stay tuned for the next episode of Canna Insights, where we continue exploring the science behind cannabis and human health.